Hello everybody and thank you very much for inviting me to talk at this conference. I'm very sorry I can't be with you so I'm talking from the south of France. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Gabby, I'm a master of wine. I, one of my specialities is rosé and I wrote a book um, entitled Rosé Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. So for tonight's talk I'm going to be talking about the Rosé Revolution. And first of all, I'm going to discuss what is the Rosé Revolution. It's a term that was, I think, coined because people were very, very surprised at the speed with which Rosé came from absolutely nowhere 20, 25 years ago to now being able to claim that maybe within another 10 years they will have one third of the rosé market, um, which has been a phenomenal success. So the rosé revolution really is wine that was in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, this very rustic image, folksy picture, nice curvy bottles, dark rosé, only for the summer, to the picture on the right, which has Sasha Lachine with one of the most expensive rosés in the world and certainly one of the biggest markets of rosé in the world with over four million bottles a year. So how did rosé in Provence, um, specifically in Provence, start off the rosé revolution? In actual fact, it started, uh, the revolution started in the late 1980s, early 1990s, where there were seven, roughly seven key things that launched rosé from being the rustic wine to the modern phenomena that it is. First of all, they started to look at the time the rosé was harvested. When it was a byproduct of red wine, it was har harvested quite late in the season. And to make a rosé wine specifically for rosé, they learned to be able to harvest earlier and guarding the fresh acidity. Manual harvesting was also important. It meant the grapes came in nice and whole bunches with no skin maceration going in on with the grapes on its way to the cellar. They started harvesting when the grapes were cool, early morning uh, or during the night. I remember in the 80s you could follow grapes fermenting away in the hot tractors on their way to the cellar. Now, by the early 90s, the grapes arrived intact, fresh, lots of acidity. In the cellar itself, another new phenomenon was very, very gentle pneumatic pressing. Again, reducing the skin contact and the tannins, the smaller the press, the gentler the press, the fresher the wine. The grapes were chilled while they were in the press. They were chilled in the fermentation tanks, fermented really cold, everything emphasising the freshness of the grapes and the freshness of the wine. And these things alone changed rosé from being a dark tannic wine to being something very fresh, very vibrant, with lots of exotic fruit going on. So by the end of the 20th century, the Provence was able to produce this totally, totally different style of rosé wine uh, on the market. A lot of the market resisted. You know, at the beginning, they weren't saying, this is an amazing new wine. They were going, oh, but, you know, we like our rustic, dark rosé. This is what we're looking for. And Provence needed to be able to convince the market that this was good. This new rosé is a good thing. And they started talking about the Mediterranean diet, light fresh salads, fresh grilled fish, perfect with this light rosé. And 2003 was a godsend for Provence, that heat wave that swept across Europe where everybody was in a Mediterranean heat wave this lovely fresh rosé is just what people wanted. And the rosé revolution was well away at this point. It was a new phenomenon. It was pretty, it was simple, it was fresh. It applied to everyone. Anybody could enjoy it and drink it. They didn't need to know about vintages, grapes, terroir, nothing. They could just enjoy it. The next big key date in this revolution is 2007. 
In 2007, Sasha Lachine launched on the market the most expensive rosé that the market knew, 80 euros a bottle. And at first we all laughed and said, nobody is going to buy a rosé at 80 euros a bottle. This is just absolutely ridiculous. But he knew the yachties market, the yacht owners in the south of France were very keen to have a wine that was very expensive and very unique. So much so that yacht designers even built wine racks designed especially for Garros in bottle styles, Magnum, Nebuchadnezzar's. And he also launched Whispering Angel, a very classic, beautiful imagery shaped bottle which now sells over 4, 000, 4 million bo bottles a year in America alone. So in 2007, we're getting big Bordeaux names. Sasha Lachine coming from Bordeaux, putting his money where um, everyone was talking with Rosé and the rest of the world was definitely sitting up. And from 2007, you can see globally people moving from red wine byproducts to making fresh Rosé. But what is Provence Rosé, this market leader that revolutionised the winemaking? And a lot of the time people will see a pale pink rosé and they'll go Provence style. Wine buyers will mention it, journalists will say Provence style, consumers will say Provence style. But in actual fact, as anyone out there who's a winemaker knows, pale pink alone does not equal Provence style in terms of taste, only in look. The sad thing, as far as I'm concerned, is that this pale pink Provence style for marketing has taken over winemaking. And we can see in 2013, it was um, just over half of all rosé produced was pale. And by 2018, almost 70 percent. Now, we've got to be careful with these figures because these are based on wine samples sent in to the Rosé Research Centre in Provence. It's not the global um, production, it is what they sample. So possibly only people who make Provence style rosé will be submitting wine. So we're not getting a fully um, comprehensive review. And the 2018 figures are significant because 2018 was a particularly pale year. A lot of people, even in, you know, from Italy, around France, were commenting that their rosé was paler than usual. So colour is definitely a big significance. So rosé, as I say, has grown in sales enormously. This has been a massive phenomena in production. And this is from 2018, we had 3.5 billion bottles, it's massive. You can see Hungary is still a niche producer of rosé, so not really in the competition there. But what's interesting is this year-on-year -year growth, not just from France, which has reached saturation almost on production, but we're getting rosé from across America, Australia, South America, across Europe. It is a global phenomenon with these wines um, growing in quality, not just in uh, pink wines. Again, we have to be very careful with statistics because some countries will group red and rosé together because they identify production through the colour of the grapes that are planted. So give or take, these, these numbers are roughly what we know about rosé. A few years ago, France, Spain and Italy were the triumvirate which controlled rosé production. And you can see that America is now number two. This is, this is a dramatic, absolutely dramatic growth in rosé production. And Italy has dropped, plummeted in volume. This does not mean that Italy is no longer producing uh, rosé. What it does mean is that it's reduced its bulk rosé production and is improving the quality. Big significance there. It's not bulk wine. Spain, on the other hand, produces a vast amount of bulk rosé. A lot of it, nobody knows where it goes. Big complaints that it crosses the border into France, 
possibly to make fruit flavoured rosé wines. We don't really know. But Spain also makes some beautiful, beautiful top wine. Uh, we have Tondonia, you know, 40 to 50 euros a bottle from Rioja. A lot of very, very good Rioja rosés. Uh, we're looking at rosé from Tempranillo, Bobal, Grenache. Um, a lot of very, very lovely styles. Italy, let's go back to Italy just for a moment. They have uh, 500 different grape varieties, 400 different appellations. Very, very confusing for the consumer, but they are focusing on five or six very specific appellations for their marketing. Um, all with very regional styles, all with in native indigenous Italian grapes. So that makes their marketing much more easy. The other country is Germany. Germany's growing really, really fast. And one reason for that is that it's very strong on organic wine production, which means that Scandinavia um, and America are very keen on this organic rosé production. So they're building up very, very big sales there. The other places that I think would be very interesting to look at are places like New Zealand. New Zealand is tiny, but it has tripled in rosé production in the past three years. And they are outside EU rules, so they can make rosé from a white wine coloured pink. It sounds weird, and the first time you have it is very, very strange, but they are forging ahead with their New Zealand identity of pure fruit, fresh, vibrant, acidity, lots of purity. So a lot of them are Sauvignon Blanc based, so you get that herbaceous um, gooseberry fruit and then 10% of red wine added in at the end, which is quite uh, a curious uh, style, but is growing. South Africa, that's still growing, but it's very much keeping local. Argentina and Chile, um, and Uruguay, 50% of Uruguay's production is rosé, have a big market towards America. So uh, Chile has a lot of Cabernet style, Argentina a lot of Malbec, Uruguay a lot of Tanat in their rosés. So creating their own regional style. America, white zin is plummeting, but uh, other rosé styles have gone up, dry rosé has gone up by about 20%. So a big shift in how their production is going. lot of varietal rosé, rosé of Pinot Noir, rosé of Grenache, rosé of Cabernet, rosé of Syrah, plus um, hybrid rosés in some of the more marginal states. So this is, although there's a rosé... Uh, Originally, it was just everybody trying to make fresh pale rosé. There is an enormous growth in regional styles. So I just wanted to look at what 2020 has done to the rosé revolution. What has changed for the market? First of all, COVID. Well, we all know restaurants are not open. More people are drinking at home. And rosé fits in with drinking at home beautifully. It's an easy style um, wine to have at home. UK has had a big growth in rosé sales, but we don't really know how Brexit is going to affect sales. So there's a potential for a growth in rosé in supermarkets. Waitrose Supermarket recorded 400% increase in rosé sales last year. So they are really fueling a lot of rosé production. America, trade tariffs. Uh, this has had a big impact because they have imposed massively high tariffs on French, Spanish and German wine um, in retaliation for various other trade deals which has knocked them out of the market. So Italy is gearing up to sell to America, as could Hungary, and this growth in rosé production. Packaging, bag in box, cans, smaller uh, bottles. You know, 2019, everyone was talking magnums. Magnums are no good when you're only at home. So that is a big problem. Climate change, that is an interesting one because with longer, hotter summers, we're drinking more rosé, but also significantly longer, hotter summers, big red wines are no longer quite so popular. Light red wines, 
almost becoming darker rosés are very, very in. They're light, they're fresh. So although Schiller has been declining in style, it's potentially a very on-trend wine for 2021-2022. Growth in organic wine. This is very big. The natural wine movement has taken over by storm, largely because of negative publicity on additives in wine. So organic is really, really big. Uh, Prosecco launching pink Prosecco means pink fizz is very, very, very on trend. Everyone is talking pink fizz. And do you remember I said at the beginning that one of the marketing traits for rosé was that you didn't need to know your grape varieties, your terroir and your vintages. That is beginning to change. There is now so much rosé on the market that has this slightly anonymous style that buyers are looking for something a bit more interesting with a very unique regional style and they're looking for unusual grape varieties. So we're really getting a shift in this revolution from how it was to maybe how it could be. And I wanted to have a look at this regional styles and indigenous grape varieties in terms of the Hungarian market. So obviously with 22 appellations in Hungary, I'm not going to go through every single regional style. And I'm talking as an outsider who has tasted a fair amount of uh, Hungarian rosé, but I'm not yet getting very, very clearly defined regional styles. I'm not getting anyone shouting out, this is regional styles from Hungary or a national style. So I've divided Hungary loosely into five styles that I thought an international market could understand. The Great Plains, the Kunzag. Now that is interesting because it is the cowboy country of Hungary, it is the Wild West, it is California. This for me is an area where Hungary could be very experimental with rosé. Any grapes could go. Um, there are no rules. It is a large area. Very, very exciting. Um, it's the place where I've had grape varieties uh, such as Medina and Nero, um, vibrant, very, very new world style. Really quite enjoyed that. And the volume, you know, this is something where there is the space and the volume that allows people to look at different wines. The Northeast. So we'll forget Tokai really, because I don't think Tokai needs to diversify into Rosé, but let's look at the Buk Mountains, Eger, Matra. We're looking at the cooler climate zones of Hungary, the crisp freshness. And I was thinking what, what was being very successful um, in Eger is the Egri Shilag wines, taking the Bikavir character of the wines to make um, a composed white wine. Well, what a cuvee, a rosé cuvee that reflects the Eger character might be quite interesting. Volcanic soils, altitude, We've, there are a few things that could really stand out as being a northern style of Hungary. I quite liked the idea of the volcanic soils being marketed more. And Eger is the second largest rosé producer already in Hungary. The Balaton region. Well, this is slightly more confusing because we have Mediterranean climate with some lovely ripe soft fruit already coming through. And at the same time, we're getting producers on volcanic soils producing uh, more mineral, more structured wines. So maybe more difficult to do a single Lake Balaton uh, rosé. But thinking of the Balaton boar and Olaz Riesling, could there be variations in style of Lake Balaton with rosé? Just an idea, trying to... Uh, I spoke to a couple of importers who said they only knew Lake Balaton rosé, but they only knew one style. So to show them the variety would be very interesting. Going to the south, uh, Villang with Cabernet Franc and Portuguesa, possibly a warm, rich, more big bodied rosés. Rosé doesn't always have to be the fresh and elegant Provence style. We could actually have some more 
full-bodied gastronomic style wines coming from the south. Uh, Sexard, I've personally found that I've really enjoyed the Schillers from Sexard. Somehow or other, they have a seriousness and a freshness that I've really, really enjoyed. And maybe that's something that is worthwhile looking at. And the Northwest. Well, we've got a check. Maybe that could be um, seen very much as rosé um, sparkling wine. I'm not sure. Should um, Chopron uh, work with more with Cake Francoche? Cake Francoche is one of the star grape varieties of Hungary for rosé. Uh, Provence, the Provence Research Centre has been very, very excited with the opportunities with Cake Francoche. Lovely, fresh acidity, very, very vibrant fruit. And I've not mentioned that in the other areas, but really Cake Francoche in all the areas showing different styles would be very good. I've done blind tastings of Hungarian rosé and I've failed miserably in trying to identify regional points. So what I'm looking at now is this rosé revolution. We've got the quality established. What we're looking for now is innovation, regionality, uniqueness, uh, working on top of this quality level that has been taking over the red and white wine world. And for me, rosé wine is actually one of the most exciting and dynamic categories in wine. There is so much that can be done, whether it's oak, amphora, um, playing around with harvest, a bit of botrytis, a bit of sweetness, um, soil varieties. Soil actually is reflected very well in the delicacy of rosé. So I'm really excited and I think there's a lot going on with this rosé revolution. Thank you.